this book. Second one. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered around him, and he was by the sea. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly. My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So Jesus went with Jairus. A large crowd followed him, pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better. But rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd, touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately, her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? The disciple said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on me? How can you say that you touched me? Jesus looked all around to see who had done it. The woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before his feet and told him the whole truth. She said to her daughter, Your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Jesus allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Balitakum, which means in Aramaic, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this they were overcome with amazement. Jesus strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. synagogue and his child that was ill to the point of death. The other story inserted by Mark is a story about a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. Mark always has a reason for doing what he does in terms of stories that he had heard. He inserted the story of a woman hemorrhaging on purpose. 
It comes in between the, the beginning and the end of the story of Jairus. And we're going to talk about those two briefly today. So I told Mike in the back that today I was going to try to do a homily rather than a sermon, which means it will be 15 minutes rather than 30. I am impressed by a number of things in this gospel. Most of it has to do with the courage in the midst of worldly prejudice to seek the things of God no matter what the community said, what it had done, or what it had believed. That God was active in the midst of his community without prejudice. Of course, prejudice means making a decision about something before you know anything about it. Would you say that's true? All of us, at some time in our life, are prejudiced, prejudiced against something or someone. It's the nature of original sin. Sin in which one becomes either confused or afraid of the other and sets up artificial boundaries to keep them from interfering in my space. Think about Jairus and his position in the synagogue. Actually, Brad, he was like a senior ward in the synagogue. He was in charge of the synagogue and made sure that worship was done in decency and in order. He was in charge of the administrative things of that synagogue and was seen and experienced great respect within the community in which he served. Everybody liked him. He's a good guy. He was a true Jew and committed to his faith and committed to the community in which he served. Then something happens. It changes all of his perspective. Jairus, the leader of this community, has a family, and within this family is maybe not his only daughter, but a precious daughter of his, and she had just turned 12 years old, or was 12 years old. In Judaism, when a female turned 12, she was considered a woman, not a child. She's just beginning her life. And she's dying. None of the physicians could do anything, just like the physicians with the woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. This woman was suffering with disease, OBGYN disease, for 12 years and had spent all of her money on physicians and rabbis who thought they knew how to take care of this issue. In Leviticus, it says for a woman who's hemorrhaging that what she needs to do is to take an ostrich egg and carry it in a piece of linen around. That's in Leviticus. That's absurd, isn't it? Or it may be an act of faith. But we as modern people, as we look at Leviticus and some of the things that need to be done for healing, they seem ridiculous to us but not to those of the time of Jesus, not to those who were a part of the community of faith, the synagogue across the Sea of Galilee, in which Jesus finds himself as an itinerant preacher, known by some and many in that community as being someone who was special and unique. Word obviously had gotten to Jairus that Jesus was able to do things that no one else could do. 
All the authorities in Jerusalem had turned their backs on this itinerant Nazarene prophet, teacher, preacher. Would that not be the same for him? What is going to happen to Jairus in terms of his position in the community if he takes a stand for all the hope that he has left? Jairus is a man of great courage. He leaves the synagogue, this leader of the synagogue in this community, and finds this Nazarene preacher and falls at his feet, repeatedly begging him to please come and lay hands on my child, 12-year-old young woman who has not lived life. She should not die. Please come and help me and her. Everybody watching this in that community was astounded, astounded by this. How could he do this? How could he turn his back on, on our understanding of Judaism and go to this itinerant Nazarene preacher and ask him to lay hands on his child for healing? What has happened to his faith in Yahweh? All of us would do it for our child. No matter what. No matter how the world would see us, perceive of us, under, or attempt to understand us, when we would, in a sense, violate everything that we had always known because we were hopeless. We were willing to risk persecution, gossip, all of these things because he was so desperate that his love for his family and his child overcame his prejudices. He follows Jairus to his home where the child was lying. In the midst of that crowd, there was a woman who had been hemorrhaging for 12 years, spent all of her money, carried often eggs and linen, as the rabbis had said, and had undergone many different things to try to cure this illness, spent all her money on the doctors, and she was still sick. A woman of desperation. Not only a woman of desperation, but a woman, because of the, the prejudice against her, she was seen as unclean, that she did not even have friends that would be willing to be with her, much less care for her, touch her, or embrace her. A woman for 12 years who had been ostracized from her community because she was unclean. She's desperate. The crowds are coming with Jairus and the disciples and they're heading to Jairus' house. And in the midst of the crowd, she's saying, the only hope I have is in this Jesus. She works her way through the crowd and she touches the tassels from his robes. Immediately she is healed. Her faith in Jesus, her willingness to approach him, even though the prejudice of the time was against him, in the midst of having no other hope, she in faith goes and believes and trusts in him and touches the tassels of his robes. And as Mark says many times in his gospel, immediately she was healed. The power of the Holy Spirit was so much in complete, eternal wholeness in Jesus that when she touched his robes in faith, the power of the Holy Spirit came through him to her and immediately she was healed. And Jesus knew that something had happened, but he did not know who it had happened to. He had just felt the power of the Spirit leave him. Eventually the woman 
and her courage comes up to Jesus, falls at his feet. Jesus says something that is unbelievable. To the crowds gathered, including the disciples, he does not say, woman, you have been healed. He says, daughter. Excuse me. Not only is she healed in body, mind, and in spirit, but she is no longer a twin. For what God does, man cannot do. Man does not have the power to do those things. God can do those things because he can make that which is unclean. We come back to Jairus now. They've made their way to the house and already the news around the community is that this child has died. So they hired weepers and wailers come to the house and there's great wailing and weeping around this house. There was a prejudice of those who were outside of the house. Don't bother having this Jesus come in here. She's already dead. Already there was prejudice against him. Jesus says to them, she is not dead. She is just sleeping. In a sense, they continue to mock him. And his power. Their prejudice blinds their eyes to the truth because they weren't willing to look at the truth. They had already made up their minds because of their prejudice against him that he could do nothing. Sometimes today we feel the same way. We're prejudiced against God doing something uniquely for us and therefore we choose not to approach it. But what happens? Jesus sends all the non-believers and the mockers and the scoffers out of the house. He doesn't want them anywhere near this job because they have already given up on her. Jesus goes in Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, John's brother of James. He wants them to see something. And he wants the healing of his child. He lays hands upon her, Talitha Kum in Aramaic. The little girl lies. It's fine. In spite of the prejudices that those who were wailing outside had, those of faith were in the room and God acted. She came alive. She walked around the room. He said, sustain her with food because she will continue to live. Two people's lives were saved because of their faith in this itinerant Nazareth. It wasn't the faith of some dogma or theology. It was a faith that had to do with hope. And many times in this day, hope is missed. So what does that say for us today? Especially when it has to do with our prejudices against this, that, or the other. We all have them. Some of us are more willing than others to acknowledge them. The problem is that most of the time in our prejudices, we don't have enough information and understanding to include everybody in the family of God. And those prejudices are many, multiple. You know many of them. But in spite of our prejudices, God is at work. I want to tell you a story about uh, making assumptions. Does anyone here know who's the father of U.S. Naval Submarine Nuclear Navy? I'll give you a dollar if anyone can name 
<laughs> You're probably better because she's the only one having money. Right there. A great apple of a neighbor. Admiral Rickover started his naval career at Annapolis in 1922. He went to sea for a number of years, came out of uh, sea duty, went to Columbia University in 1929, acquired a master's in electrical engineering. He's an engineer. I figured you'd know that. <laughs> he was interested in reliability and safety for his submarines and for his sailors. Well, the first commission nuclear submarine was what? Nautilus. Nautilus. And here's a yeah, no. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Nautilus was the first uh, nuclear submarine. The fuel was laid in uh, the uh, early 50s and in 54 it was commissioned with the sea trials. Well, every time that it did the sea trials, Admiral Rickover went. Every nuclear power submarine in our fleet, before it was allowed to go to sea on its own, Rickover went. He went down to go down with This great man of our naval history served uh, our nation for 63 years. He retired in 1981. Five years later, he passed away at 86. All that to say, there was a young naval officer who was a lieutenant commander and every officer aboard every nuclear submarine in our Navy in the 50s, in the 60s, before they could take command, either as executive officer or commanding officer, had to be interviewed personally by Holly Rickover. Does anyone know who was the executive officer of the Nautilus? President Jimmy Carter. Now, when Jimmy Carter was slated, meaning they're going to look at you to see if you have three arms or whatever, before Rickover would see him, he'd gone through unbelievable scrutiny and, and vetting to get to the point, in terms of his education and experience, to be able to sit before Rickover and talk about sea service and the nuclear name. Rickover always had stake with those officers. Probably carrots and potatoes. And he would talk and observe his officers, their behavior. The first officer for executive officer that came before Rick Over did something that was so innocent that cost him the job as executive officer on the on the Nautilus. You know what it was? The song that on the set. Absolutely. That was Judy. Laura, too. I'm so glad y'all know about Navy history. It makes me happy. Rick Over said to this first executive officer that salt and pepper his steak before he ate, he says, I choose not to have any officer in my Navy and in my nuclear submarines who makes decisions before they get all the facts. I think personally it was just an accident that Jimmy Carter didn't do it. But that's my own political prejudice. In any case, he became executive officer of the Nautilus and eventually uh, uh, George Peanut Farrell becomes president of the United States. And whether one cares about Jimmy Carter or not, I happen to have met him and known him. And I like him personally, just didn't care for him professionally. Why am I saying that? It has to do with making decisions before we have all the facts. And when we do that, we act impulsively. And we do that in human relations because we decide who we're going to love and who we're going to accept before we even know who they are. And when we do that, we're going to find healing for ourselves or for them. 
Pray about these things, offering to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.